Hello, I'm Daniel Meyer, pastor of First Baptist Church of River Falls, Wisconsin, and we're so glad that you've decided to tune in today to Blessed Hope Radio Broadcast. It's great to have you all listening to today's message titled, Contending for the Faith. I hope that these next few minutes are a blessing to all of you, and that you hear from God as I relay this message He has given to me to give to you. Turn, if you would, in your Bible to the general epistle of Jude. It's the second to the last book in your Bible. It's right after the third epistle of John and right before the last book, Revelation, you'll find the general epistle of Jude. It's a small little epistle, contains 25 verses, 579 words, and takes about 3 minutes and 30 seconds to read it aloud. It's a particularly favorite book of mine in the Bible. I've read it numerous times. It's so, so sweet to read, so short, so full of truth. But now, just like you'd find in the book of the Acts of the Apostles, which is for the beginning of the church, we find here that the epistle of Jude really should be titled The Acts of the Apostates for the Last Days. This book contains parallels with James. The book of James is about works in faith, and Jude is about works that are evil. It's our contention that this epistle was written sometime uh, around 65 to maybe as late as 80 AD. And we find here this, this particular epistle uh, breaks itself down into a nice little outline of 11 uh, themes. Now, verses 1 through 2 is about assurance of the Christian faith. Do you know what you need? You need assurance in your faith in Christ. You know what I need? I need assurance in my faith in Christ. Secondly, we find uh, verse 3 is about believers and their faith. You know what you need? you need? You need reassurance about your faith. You do and I do. In verse number 4, we learn about apostates described. Verses 5 through 8, we learn about apostasy in the Old Testament history. Much of what we have in the New Testament is just commentary on the Old Testament. Thus, without the Old Testament, you wouldn't have the New Testament. You need both. Verses 9 through 10, we learn about apostasy in the supernatural realm. Verse 11, we see an ancient trio of apostates that show up. And if you study your Bible, you'll see that unholy trinity show up all the time. Verse 12 through 13, we see apostasy in the natural realm. Verse 14 through 16, we see apostasy in the Old Testament prophecy. Verses 17 through 19, we see apostates described. Verse 20 through 23, we see believers and their faith again. And then the book concludes with verses 24 and 25, an assurance of the Christian. You know what you need and you know what I need in these days in which we live? We need assurance in our Christian walk. Notice here in verse number 1, Jude, verse 1, Bible says, Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and the brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father, and preserved in Jesus Christ, and called. Mercy unto you, and peace and love be multiplied. Verse 3, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you, and exhort you, that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. So we're going to talk about this morning. We're going to talk about contending for the faith. You know what's needed today more than ever? Contending for the faith. You need to contend for the faith, just like I need to contend for the faith. Our churches need to contend for the faith. The believers that go to church need to contend for the faith. And those believers that don't go to church, you need to contend for the faith. That's a great epistle. So let's go to the Lord and ask him to help us this morning. Father, we need your help as we open the scriptures. We pray that you'd give us the words to say. Pray that you'd give me clarity of mind and thought. Pray that you'd be able to take your word and hide it in their heart. Lord, that they might receive that incorruptible seed. Father, we need your help. We pray that you bless this time now. In your son's precious name, Jesus, amen. We know that as this epistle starts, Jude says that he's a servant of Jesus. Do you know that there's no higher office which we might obtain than being a servant of Jesus Christ? That's the highest glory a man or an angel can aspire to obtain, being a servant of Jesus Christ. It is the most important office that there is to have. Boy, because he is the King of kings and Lord of lords, and we get to be part of his administration. And Jude here is acknowledging the fact that he's a servant. As he sets forth his authorship and, and the audience, he makes mention of the fact that he is the brother of James. Now, we don't have time to run all the cross-references down so that you can see this, but if you read Galatians chapter number 1, you would learn that this James that is talking about is really the Lord's half-brother. So Jude is the brother of James. They're full brothers. And they're both half-brothers to the Lord Jesus Christ. But notice, as we read in that first verse, you can't find Jude, nor can you find James, ever laying claim to the fact that they are the Lord's brother. They don't hide the fact, they don't rely on the fact that they're 
familiar with the Lord. In other words, they're not going to use nepotism to get their message across. You know, our world is full of people that employ nepotism and lean upon those things and drop names. And yet here we see Jude not willing to do that. His name is given in Greek. It is done by the Holy Spirit to ensure the reader makes a clear distinction between him and the traitor, Judas. His word, his name in the Hebrew means praise or celebration. Thus, only those who have Jesus and bear him can praise God. What a, what a wonderful message that we can get out of this aspect regarding his name. And it would do the Bible student full well to study the scriptures and to run names and see what they mean because names have meaning, especially in the Bible. People aren't just named willy-nilly names like they seem to be named today. The names had specific meaning. And we note that Jude has showed humility. He's not demanding to be called anything but a servant of Jesus Christ. You know, that's what everybody should demand. If you're going to demand one thing in this life, just demand that people notice and call you by the fact that you're a servant of Jesus Christ. Because that's what's needed. Needed to be recognized that you are but a servant, or I'm but a servant. The Bible would teach us that we are duty-bound to serve and bring honor. We need to serve Him wholly. Matthew chapter 6, verse 24, No man can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. We must serve, and we must serve obediently. When God corrects us, and he does, according to Hebrews chapter 12, he'll, he'll chastise in his children. When he corrects us, and this chastening comes, boy, we ought to accept it. We ought to understand that he's desired to make us better than what we are. We must serve him submissively. We must allow what would and would not, bearing and forbearing, Perhaps we might ask amiss, perhaps it's better not. The wages are set and the veils are uncertain. Submissive, it's not our will, but rather his. And we must get to the place where we go not beyond our own authority. Our purpose then is to be submissive and to please him. That's Revelation chapter 4, verse number 11. It's the purpose of why God created man. Revelation 4, 11, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. We were created to serve him. We were created to please him. We were created to have that perfect fellowship. He's looking for friends. He's not looking for robots. Secondly, we must come at every call. Much throughout the Bible, you'll notice that, boy, everybody was called. Abraham, Abraham, Genesis 22. Jacob, Jacob, Genesis 46. Moses, Moses, Exodus chapter 3. And so on and so forth. When God calls, we must answer. And much like you find in the narrative of Luke chapter 19, when Jesus is on his way, he finds Zacchaeus up in a tree, and he called Zacchaeus by name. Rest assured, we hope that God knows you by name. And if he does know you by name, he's calling you by name. And when he calls, you must come. And we must not prefer some things over others regarding our service. I'll tell you a little story I remember uh, back in the day when I surrendered and wanted to do something for the Lord, and I went and asked my pastor, you know, what what did, what did you have for me? I'm, I'm Lord wants to use me, and he asked if I could swap out the toilet in the men's bathroom. Of course, initially, that's not what I wanted to do. I wanted some grand position, you know, to stand behind the pulpit and preach, or to do something, you know, extraordinarily worthy. And yet, the Lord wanted me to change the toilet out. Must not prefer something over the other. I'm minded of an employer I once worked for who used to ask people if they wanted to work on Saturday. And he would get furious when they asked him doing what. His response was, is the fact that he wasn't trying to give them selective duty. He wanted to know if they wanted to work. And so he was only interested in those that wanted to work, not those that wanted to pick and choose what they wanted to do. So we must not prefer something over another. And we must never refuse, Acts chapter 10, verse 33, we must never refuse service to the Lord. And so we see that he's a servant. We see that he's a brother. And notice who his audience is, to them that are sanctified by God. Do you know that we're sanctified by God, for God, for God's will? God does the work. When we yield to him, we are sanctified because of what he's done. 1 Corinthians 1, 2, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus. Hebrews 10, 14, for by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. We're sanctified in Christ. Jude is writing to the believer those that are sanctified. They're sanctified by God, the Father, 
and preserved in Jesus Christ. We have a privilege. We can see that twofold action that takes place. One, it's a privilege. Secondly, the author bestowed action. That's God the Father. The privileges is by way of separation. We are separated, meaning we're without spot, we're without blemish, 1 Peter 1.19. What a privilege it is to be sanctified. What a privilege it is to be separated. What a privilege to see that God's working in our lives. It's also a privilege by way of celebration, right? We should be happy and excited that we're set apart. Thirdly, it's a privilege by way of fruitation. Romans 7, 4, that we should bring forth fruit unto God, right? We're separated, we're privileged, we're sanctified for the sole purpose of bearing fruit. We're privileged by way of application. That's Romans 1, verse 16, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, or it's by way of application. It's a privilege by His holiness. God said, be holy for I am holy. Part of this sanctified and preserved is desiring to get us to a place where we become more and more like Him. We have a privileged destination. Privileged. We're looking for a home that's reserved in heaven for us. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse number 4. So there's a lot you can pull out of this very first verse. I know people read, read the Bible and they, they come across verses like this first one and they think, wow, it doesn't really matter if I, I read it. There's not much in there, just an introduction. But yet it's so full of truth so full of power that God has for each of us right there. Right here in this very first speaks to the spiritual nature. Our soul is preserved, right? We're preserved from punishment. We are free from the curse, Galatians 3.13. Christ has redeemed us. Boy, we're preserved. But we're only preserved in Jesus Christ. Without Jesus Christ, we're not preserved. So it's spiritual. It's eternal, right? We have both a new body and the soul is going to be in heaven. Sanctification and preservation of the saints. All former blessings without, this is so small a purpose, in that God not only called us, but he sanctifies. And so we can see the urgentness of Jude's writing. We can understand who he's writing to. We can understand who he is. We can understand why, his, why he's even writing this wonderful epistle. In verse number two, we see that he, he says, Mercy unto you and peace and love be multiplied. This is a type of prayer, a type of salutary address. Today we might say something like, may the mercy of God and the peace of God and the love of God be increased or multiplied to you. Something similar that the Apostle Paul uses, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse number 2. Notice that this is a powerful type of prayer. It's common practice, especially in the Old Testament, of God's children blessing other people. Taken from the idea of the Arianic blessing you find in Numbers chapter 6, where the priests blessed the children of Israel. Yet we see in the book of Ruth, we see that Boaz does the same. The, Boaz blesses his, his servants, the reapers, out working in the field. We see that David practiced the same thing. So it's a, it's a common practice. It's, it's missing today. It is. It's missing today that you would bless somebody in, in the name of the Lord. But you know what everybody needs? Everybody needs God's mercy. They need God's mercy to maintain their purity. But the constant supply of grace that the saints are given from God keeps from us from falling. It's God's mercy. You need God's mercy. Notice, do you need God's mercy before peace? One of the ways that they'll, they'll be able to tell the, the Antichrist in the end times is when he comes on the scene, he'll talk about peace, but never offering mercy. You know what you need before peace? You need mercy. Go back and look at the sacrifices. Go back and look and see in the Old Testament when they actually got the peace. They only got the peace after the offerings were made. In other words, they needed the mercy long before they got the peace. You know what you need and I need? We need that mercy that comes long before we get the peace. And then we need God's peace. And God's peace is to maintain our preservation. Right? God gives us a peace that the world can't provide. The godly are safe. We're safe from the calamity. Right? We don't need to worry. God's in control. We have this peace that passes all understanding that God has given us. So we need the mercy of God. We need the peace of God. We need God's love. God's love inspires us, should inspire you in your, in your life to work and to, to die for the Savior. You know, really, that's the, the reality of it is, is we need God's love. There's only one incentive to the love of Jesus, and that is, there's only one incentive. That's the love of Jesus. There are considerations, 
but that's the mainspring, right? The grand design of the ages in the time of wretchedness, hence it's the mercy is put first. He says something very similar uh, in this very epistle. We can see the Trinity. I know there's some non-Trinitarians out there that don't like the Trinity and say that you can't find the Trinity, but we can find the Trinity in, in, in Jude verse 21 and 20. We can find him. Notice that we see in verse 21, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ under the eternal life, right? The mercy of Jesus Christ, there's the Son. In verse 20, but ye beloved, building up yourselves in the most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, there's the Holy Spirit. And verse 21, uh, talking about the eternal life. We see love of God, that's the Father. For God so loved the world. There's the, there's the Trinity right there in, the, in this epistle. So we get a great testimony about the Holy Trinity. Every believer's sanctification is a long and enduring process that requires God pouring out mercy, peace, and love upon his child. We reciprocate with the same by offering mercy, peace, and love towards one another as we grow in faith. Remember, we're supposed to be like him. We are supposed to be like him. In verse number three, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Now we start to see really why he's writing. The reason for him sending this epistle is to write the exhortation. That's the, that's the whole body of the epistle. To what? Because the believers aren't doing what they're supposed to be doing. Now, if we suppose that it's written approximately 66 AD, we need that to understand the idea that already, already in this early church, right? If it's written 66 AD and Jesus died uh, between 30 and 33 AD, depending on how you want to uh, look at the calendar, we're, 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 30, we're 33 years or more from the, the death of Christ. And already, already in the, in the early church, we see in verse number four, for there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying our Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. This is why he's writing. He's writing because there's men already in the church. That means there's men already in the pulpit. That means there's men already writing fictitious writings denying the perfect sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And so because of that, Jude needs to write that they would go out and contend for the faith. There's people that are preying upon the believer. And so Jude is praying that they will take the initiative and contend for the faith. The potential danger had become real. I mean, the Apostle Paul had written to the, those in Ephesus in Acts chapter 20 about grievous wolves that would come in and not spare the flock. Well, they're already in the congregation. They're already in not sparing the flock. So Jude needs to write. Notice he starts out here in this verse and he says, Beloved. That means he's emulating God's love. And thus we can read that he truly cares for his, his readers. He's, he's like a pastor. You get to start seeing a glimpse of his heart. He's talking, he's calling him beloved. Man, that, that verse, that, that word is used of Israel. It's used of Solomon. It's used of the believer. Boy, it's a common title that you find throughout the scriptures. And yet it means the amiableness and fitness for and worthiness of. It denotes a vehement love and very intense tenderness. He cares for his audience. And the reason why he cares for his audience is, is those, those men in verse number four, those ungodly men that are full of lasciviousness, which we'll talk about next week. And so we see the fact that he, he loves his audience. He's concerned about them. He's got a duty in love. He respects a debt owed to all. Romans 13, 8, right? That's where the Bible says, Oh, no man, anything but love. Jude is exercising that. He cares for them. He cares for their soul. He's trying to gain their love in return, right? He's, he's avoiding dissimulation. He's being courteous. He's having pure affections. He's really concerned. He's concerned about the destruction that's going to come upon them for following and being enticed by this subversive teaching. Right? I, I give all diligence. He's going to give all diligence. Judah's mindful of those who'd be reading this epistle were going to be in need of additions to their spiritual warfare. He endeavors to do them good. You know, that's the position of the pastor. 
the position of the pastor is endeavoring to do all that listen good. He's trying to equip them and teach them and exhort them and encourage them to do good, to understand where they're at. He's invested in them, signifies an earnest and serious vent and application and intent of the mind in which things are being done studiously. Also has a notion of being future-centered. Also signifies the speed in which he's taking. I gave all diligence to write. That means I set everything else aside. Meaning Jude was gonna meaning Jude was gonna write something else, and yet because of the circumstances of the day, he had to shift, and he's got to give all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation. He has to. He had to make haste. He's got to supply effort. Notice that he's laboring both in word and in doctrine. We know that piety is no enemy of courtesy. We know that work and labor of a minister should proceed from a love to his people. He loves his flock. He loves his congregation. People should study to be fit for the love of their pastor. That's a problem today. The love of the minister must not slack or be remiss. Lots of, lots of things we can pull from that. You can say, I didn't, I didn't even know that was there. I, I didn't even see that that was there. But it is there. It is. It's there. And so we need to understand. And so he's writing about common salvation. It was needful for him to write unto you and exhort you. But we notice that it was once delivered unto the saints meaning that it was delivered firmly and irrevocably, meaning it should never be taken away. 1 Peter 1.25, 1 Peter 1.25, the Bible says, But the word of the Lord endureth forever, and this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. It was delivered once for all. That means the laws were done so well that it never needs to be redone once for all. That work was done so well that it never needed to be redone. Hebrews 10, 12. That's that perfect sacrifice offered once. It should never be changed. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 11. It was delivered just one time. Hebrews 1. Delivered one time. So once delivered, once bound, our service should include charity and understand that it was delivered. Thus we can see we need an earnest contending for a faith that facilitates a serious, weighty cause in which we are to contend. I mean, we're supposed to earnestly contend. That's an athletic term in which you'd get the English word agony. That means that we have considerable enemies in which to contend with, all who require great power in which to contend. Strength and force are often necessary, yet we've seen in the Bible a giant is defeated by a child, 1 Samuel 17. And putting forth against the enemy... Standing still doesn't necessitate contending. Contending provides a victory, though it will require some serious contention on our part. We are supposed to contend. So what is this common salvation? That is the question. What is the common salvation? Because this is what we're supposed to contend for. We're supposed to contend for the common salvation. Salvation is common. It's for all people of all nations. Acts chapter 10, 1 Timothy chapter 2, 2 Peter chapter 3, Revelation chapter 22. So salvation is common to everybody. It's available. That's the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ, right? The common people heard the Lord gladly, Mark chapter 12, verse number 37. The common people. And yet we find the common faith of the written word of God provides essential and necessary basis for the common law of any nation. That's Titus chapter 1, verse number 4. You take the Bible and throw the Bible out, you'll find that there is no common law. You'll find it. All of the laws that we have all stem from the very word of God. The common law provides the equal opportunity for life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness from the common and lawful man. Esther chapter 10. Proverbs chapter 29. So once delivered, that's 1 John 5 13. These things have I written that you may know that you have eternal life. That you can know. God wants you to know that you can have eternal life. It's given to the fact that we have a bond with our brethren. Revelation 1, verse number 5, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead, the prince of kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. You know what was going on is they weren't, they weren't telling people about the Lord. They weren't telling people about salvation. Jude has got to remind them that you're going to have to go back and contend because people don't know that. People aren't being taught that. They're forgetting about how much Jesus Christ loved us. I mean, think about it. He loved us enough to wash us with his own blood. He used the staining agent to cover up our own sins so that none could see them. So that when the 
Heavenly Father looks down. All he sees is the blood of his son, and he says, I accept that. That's a bond that we all have as believers. Our service must include charity. Charity is love in action. It's sacrificial giving of oneself without thought or benefit of return. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And lastly, we need to study to defend from error. I mean, we're supposed to earnestly contend for the faith that was once delivered unto the saints. It's the same today. The contending isn't over. The battle's not done yet. We still have much to do. We still have many to contend with and share the common salvation. That common salvation is an atonement for sin, a full admission of man's entire depravity and ruin. See, our problem is, is we look in the mirror and we like, man, I like that. I like that. I, yeah, I'm, I'm fine in God's eyes. I'm okay with that. We don't ever recognize our, our entire depravity and ruin. Secondly, we have to recognize there's a justifying righteousness. That's a necessity of an entire and sole dependence on the finished work of Christ. Not in my good works, not in my good deeds, not in my good looks, not in my pocketbook. It's all about him and not about me. It's all about him and not about you. Then we see the, the Holy Spirit. That's the renew and sanctify. That's the necessity of the influence of the Holy Spirit for the regeneration and sanctification of the soul, the ongoing process, as he molds us and shapes us from the inside out. We need to understand that, boy, that, that salvation is common. It's available. And in that common salvation, there's a pardon. There's a pardon available. And that pardon brings peace. And that pardon and peace take us into an adoption. We become joint heirs. And thus gives us dignity. We went from being sinners and poor beggars to being royalty. Boy, we're kings and priests. Provides comfort and preservation. Lastly, it gives us a joyful anticipation of what's to come. Because we have a home for sure in heaven. And yet Jude is mindful to go back and tell people, you're going to have to contend for the faith. You're going to have to tell people, it's trusting in Jesus Christ and him alone. It's trusting in his perfect sacrifice. It's trusting in his finished work on Calvary. When he was on the cross, he said, it is finished, and gave up the ghost. And no one has to add anything to it. I know we don't like to think in those relative terms, but boy, just some 30 years after the death of Jesus Christ, Jude is minded of the Holy Spirit to write, to exhort the believer then, just like the believer today, to earnestly contend for the faith. We don't have a religion, we have faith in Jesus Christ. You're going to need faith in Christ. Religion won't get it done. Religion on its best day in the scriptures. Religious in his best day is seen in Genesis chapter 3 with old Adam and Eve sewing fig leaves together trying to hide from the Lord. That's religion. That's all religion will produce. And yet here Jude is telling all. You're going to have to earnestly contend for the faith. It's an exhortation. It's because it's needful. It's needed to accept the salvation. It's needed to publish the salvation. It's, we're needed to defend the salvation. Why? Because it concerns all, all classes, every one of us, poor, rich, needy, all of us. And it's all offered because of one, one man, one man who had the offices of mediator, one man who had the office of prophet, one man who had the office of priest, and one man who's coming again to rule and reign as king. I'm telling you, it's once delivered, and our job today is to go out and earnestly contend. Contend, meaning that we're going to have to sweat and labor and anguish, contending, contending for the faith. I don't know about you. I don't know about you. But now, in the current calamity which all of us find ourselves in, this current epidemic, this crisis, it's needful. It's needful for all of us that are believers to earnestly contend for the faith. Religion won't get it done. We need believers that are willing to earnestly contend for the faith. Yeah, you might take a little ridicule, but Romans chapter 1 talks about, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of salvation. Power. There's real power in the gospel. There's power in the gospel message. So while we might anguish, while we might have to contend, we need to do so because it's needful, because there's people out there that are dependent upon it. We need to share that by faith and show people the scriptures because the scriptures are where the power's at. The power's in the very word of God. Will you contend for the faith with me? 
Let's bow our heads and pray. Heavenly Father, we are dependent upon you. We're dependent for how you work in our lives, and we pray that you'd give us the courage and the power to go forward and to earnestly contend for the faith. We ask these things in your Son's precious and holy name, Jesus. Amen. Thank you for taking time to tune in today to Blessed Hope Radio Broadcast. I'd like to personally invite you to attend one of our church services. Our address is 814 South Wasson Lane, River Falls, Wisconsin. You can follow us on Facebook at First Baptist Church RF, and you can like us on YouTube. We can be reached by telephone at area code 715-425-5220. Again, I'm Pastor Daniel Meyer thanking you, and God bless. We hope to see you here, there, or in the air.